Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alexandra Hawkins, and this past summer, I have both the honor and the privilege of working under the mentorship of Dr. Kathy Hatcher in the Department of Biomedical Sciences at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine on a project entitled, The Effect of TBX5 Gene Deletion on HF1 and Cell Adhesion and Heart Development. Now, before I delve into the specifics of my research, allow me to provide you with some background information to further your knowledge of my experiment. Holter-Rahm syndrome, also known as HOS, is a rare disorder that affects about every one out of 100,000 people. This syndrome is categorized by a congenital heart defect as these defects develop before birth and involve deformations within the structure of the heart. Additionally, those diagnosed with HOS also possess abnormal bone development within the upper, within the upper lips. Furthermore, this genetic disorder is inherited autosomal dominantly and is caused by a missing intrication mutation in the TBX5 gene. The TBX5 gene is a part of the TBOX family, which plays an important role in embryonic growth. The TBX5 gene is responsible for making the TBX5 protein that encodes instructions on the formation of organs and tissues during embryonic development. TBX5 is also a transcription factor that is responsible for activating other genes active during the development of upper limbs and heart. However, when a mutation in the TBX5 gene occurs, it can no longer produce the TBX5 protein, leading to congenital deformations in the development of the hands, wrists, arms, and heart. The human heart is a muscle that pumps blood to every part of the body. At the fully developed stage, the heart consists of four chambers, the right atrium, the left atrium, the right ventricle, and the left ventricle. The septum acts as a wall and divides the right and left sides of the heart, as the atrial septum divides two atria and the ventricular septum divides two ventricles. The TBX5 protein is critical in the creation of the septum, so once the TBX5 gene becomes mutated, the septum, the protein is consequently affected, and therefore the septum cannot correctly form. When this happens, those diagnosed with HOS and who also possess a congenital heart defect are most, li are most likely to possess an atrial septal defect, a hole in the atrial septum, or a ventricular septal defect, a hole in the ventricular septum. It is also possible for those diagnosed to possess cardiac conduction disease or have impaired formation of the coronary vessels. Now, in order to further understand how TBX5 works in the human heart and how the mutation of that gene causes Holter-Rahm syndrome, scientists have developed transgenic mice that do not possess high quantities of TBX5. These transgenic mice are used to evaluate the expression and function of many types of genes as their embryos and heart model the human embryo and heart. Now, before the heart begins to form into the chambers, the heart begins to form by layers. During embryonic development, the heart consists of three layers, the epicardium, myocardium, and the endocardium. The epicardium is the inner layer of the pericardium that surrounds the heart and the great blood vessels. The myocardium is the muscle tissue that forms a thick layer between the epicardium and the endocardium. And finally, the endocardium acts as the lining of the anterior surface of the heart chambers and consists of a layer of endothelial cells and an underlying layer of connected tissue. The proepicardium, shown here in purple, lies next to the heart tube during embryonic development, and it consists of a, a mesothelial and epithelial cells. The proepicardium is the progenitor to the epicardium, pericardium, vascular smooth muscle cells, and endothelial cells of the coronary vessels, essentially meaning that all these structures originate from the proepicardium. However, specifically for my research, we focus on one important task of the proepicardium, and that is how these cells migrate over the myocardium in order to form the epicardium. After forming the epicardium, the EPDCs, or epicardial-derived cells, migrate from the epicardium into the sub-epicardial spaces and spaces within the myocardium. There, the EPDCs undergo epithelial mesenchymal transformation in order to form the endothelial cells of the coronary vessels and um, the smooth muscle. It has been proven that the TBX5 protein is present in the proepicardium during embryonic development and is also present in the vascular endothelial cells of the coronary vessels. However, interestingly enough, it has also been shown that there were specific regions within the embryonic heart of the mutant TBX5 mouse in which the epicardium was not fully developed as compared to a normal wild-type mouse. This was a significant discovery as it was also discovered that the epicardial defect led to impaired formation of the coronary vessels as shown in these pictures. In a recent experiment done by my mentor, the lab of Dr. Hatcher studied embryonic transgenic mice in which the TBX5 gene had been deleted from the proepicardium. The results showed that these mice had impaired formation in the proepicardium, the epicardium, and the coronary vessels, as all of these layers failed to develop properly. 
Furthermore, other genes normally expressed during embryonic development were either not expressed or decreased in expression, in expression once the TBX5 gene was removed. One of these genes affected was HF1. HF1 encodes a cell adhesion protein that is shown to be active in neuronal cell adhesion. HF1, however, has never been studied in extra cardiac tissue, and therefore the expression and function of that protein has never been identified. Because of this, my project will focus on evaluating the cardiac expression of HF1 during embryonic and postnatal development of the heart. This now brings me to my research design portion of my experiment. The purpose of my experiment was to evaluate the cardiac expression of proteins encoded by genes that are regulated by the TBX5 transcription factor. We hypothesized that TBX5 regulates expressions of genes encoding HF1 and cell adhesion proteins that contribute to heart development. Here's a list of my materials, all of which I feel were important to the success of my experiment. Please take a moment to look them over. Now, in order to detect, detect HF1's location and function, two types of protein analysis and detection methods were used. Our first experiment that we conducted was an immunohistochemistry experiment, which consisted of both immunostaining and immunofluorescence. First, the embryonic mice tissue sections were removed from the paraffin for us to have access to the antigen within. Next, a double staining procedure took place as the first set of primary and secondary antibodies were applied, and the second set of primary and secondary antibodies were applied. And to see the results, the tissues were viewed using a fluorescent microscope. To begin the first part of our experiment, embryonic tissues that contained the heart were taken from mice at nine and a half days of age and 11 and a half days. These tissues were then thinly sectioned, placed on slides, and embedded in paraffin to serve as a form of preservation. However, since the embryonic tissues were now needed to begin the experiment, the paraffin needed to be removed in order to have access to the antigen within. The slides were placed in various solutions in order to completely remove the paraffin from the slides. The next process, antigen retrieval, was necessary in order to amass the antigen embedded within the tissue. Embedded in the tissue, the antigen had been cross-linked with the chemicals within the tissue. In order to break these crosslinks, the tissues were placed in a pressure cooker with distilled water and antigen retrieval buffer. In this way, the antigen could be localized and the previous crosslinks could be broken in order for the antibody to bind to the antigen. After the tissues cooled after being in the pressure cooker, they were washed with distilled water and PBS. They were then incubated with 3% hydrogen peroxide and were blocked with 5% goat serum in order to prevent false positive staining. Next, the double amino staining procedure took place. Double staining is necessary in order to visualize two antigens present within the same cell. The cells are stained with the primary antibody and the secondary antibody, followed by an additional primary antibody and an additional secondary antibody. In this way, when the results are viewed under fluorescent microscope, we'll be able to correctly identify two antigens. As depicted here, there are four tissue sections for each age of the mice that were labeled 1, 2, 3, and 4. Tissue sections number 1 and 3 from each age were incubated with the primary antibody HF1. However, tissue section number two and four instead remained in 5% goat serum to serve as our neg negative control. The next day, the tissue sections were incubated with our first secondary antibody, biotin goat anti-rabbit, for one hour. Following the set of washes, they were then incubated with streptavid and HRP and 5% goat serum for 30 minutes. And then following another set of washes, they were incubated with fluorescein tyramide and amplification dilutant buffer for 20 minutes at room temperature. All these secondary antibodies were used in order to amplify expression when looked at under fluorescent microscope. The additional primary antibodies we used in our experiment were PCAM and WT1. PCAM stands for platelet endothelial cell adhesion molecule and is a protein that is found in the vascular and endothelial cells of the heart where the blood vessels are located. WT1, also known as Wilms tumor 1, is a protein that is found in the epicardial cells. Wherever, um, excuse me. This double staining is important to determine if and where HF1 will bind. If it overlaps with PCAM when looked at under fluorescent microscope, we'll be able to conclude that HF1 is present in the vascular and endothelial cells and therefore in the blood vessels. If it overlaps with WT1, we'll be able to conclude that it's present in the epicardial cells. If HF1 overlaps with one or both of these, we'll be able to see exactly where HF1 adheres to in the heart and can determine the function based on the location. All the tissue sections were blocked with 5% docking serum for one hour room temperature. For the PCAM application, wells one and two were incubated with rabid anti-PCAM overnight, and for the WT1 application, wells three and four were incubated with rabid anti-WT1. The 
following day, all the tissues were incubated with another secondary antibody, Docky anti-rabbit 5.5 and 5% Docky sand for one hour. Following a round of washes, they were mounted with DAPI mounting media, a dye used to visualize the nucleus, and were covered with the cover slip in order to see the results. So the next experiment that we conducted was the Western blot. This procedure is known to be a more quantitative protein detection method because it lets us know how much of HF1 exactly adhered to in the cell. First, we ran our standards and samples. First, we created our standards and samples that we ran down a gel by the process of gel electrophoresis. This was then followed by a protein transfer from gel to membrane, and our membrane was blocked, and we began to probe for our primary antibody in order to later detect our protein of interest using chemiluminescent detection. To prep for the Western blot, parts were taken from an embryonic mouse at 14 and a half days old, a P1 mouse, and an adult mouse. These hearts were then weighed and homogenized with license buffer in order to, cre to create our samples. After resting on ice for 30 minutes, the samples were centrifuged for 25 minutes, and we collected the supernatant and stored our samples in a negative 80 degree freezer overnight. We prepared our standards using the Pierce PCA protein a assay protocols guide. In doing this, 100 microliters of the newly made solution was added to two milliliters of working reagent in order to make our standards. Our samples from the three types of mice were also diluted in whole cell extraction buffer at concentrations of 1 to 10 and 1 to 100, for a total of six samples in all. The samples were incubated at 37 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. Following the incubation, they were placed in a spectrometer to measure the optical density that would then be translated into protein concentration. Next, our proteins were diluted in living buffer and loaded into gel along with the protein standards. After the gel, the pro um, after the gel was one, the proteins were transferred to the more solid support, support of the membrane, and the membrane was blocked. Following the blocking step, the membrane was incubated in our primary antibody, HF1, and then our secondary antibody, HRP, um, goat anti-rabbit. We then viewed this using chemiluminescent detection. This brings me to my results section of my research. Shown here in images A, B, and C are the individual results from the DAPI, HF1, and PCAM staining for the E9.5 mouse. Below in MHD shows the three stainings merged together. By the pinkish color formed by the overlap of red and green, it is apparent that HF1 is present in very few endothelial cells. By this, we can conclude that HF1 may contribute to formation of some of the coronary vascular endothelial, line, endothelial lining or some formation of the endocardium. Again, A, B, and C show the separate images, but this is for the expression of W21, and D is, again, the merged image. Um, and below, we can see that AJAP1 is expressed in some epicardial cells with WT1, but not all. We can see this by looking at the pink and green cells, which show the overlap and prevalence of AJAP1 with WT1. And this, we conclude AJAP1 contributes to the formation of the epicardium and potentially the epicardial derived cells of the coronary vessels. Again, this is the PCAM staining, but for the 11 and a half, embryonic 11 and a half mass. And we can see that there's a deeper color red shown that PCAM is more prominent as the mice grow older. Because of this, HF1 may contribute to formation of the coronary endothelial cells in the endocardium lining of the heart shown by the pinkish color in the merged image. And this is the WT1 expression for the E11 and a half mouse. And we can see that HF1 is expressed in the endocardial cushion tissues that eventually become the atrioventricular atrial valves of the heart. Based on these pictures, we can again determine that HF1 is present in few population of WT1 cells. As for the Western blot, there are no bands detected in the adult heart, which is why it's not present in this image. It's possible that HF1 expression decreases below the level of detection in adulthood. However, there were some bands represented for the embryonic and the P1 mouse, although they were not at optimal conditions. This leads me to my discussion portion of my research. First, let me reiterate my hypothesis that stated TBX5 regulates expressions of genes encoding HF1 cell adhesion proteins that contribute to heart development. This hypothesis was accepted due to the fact that HF1 was present in some epicardial cells and some coronary arteries. By this, we are able to conclude that the HF1 is involved in extracardiac tissue and heart development. For our research, we wanted to determine where HF1 was located in, our, in the heart and did this by using different protein markers present within different types of cells. We are able to conclude that it is present in the epicardium, the endocardium, and the coronary arteries. Now we would like to discover what other cell types HF1 co-localizes with within the heart. 
Here's a list of the people I would like to acknowledge for their help in my research. Thank you. I will now open the floor to any questions, comments, and constructive criticism. Yes. Can I just say your Amina fluorescence was beautiful? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 